people familiar with the uh, Tarpons project will know that uh, uh, that the uh, problem uh, of contamination in Tarpons in the Coke oven site's been around for, I think, 20 odd years. This has been a legacy from uh, 100 years of steel making and 200 years of coal mining in Cape Breton. The legacy we were left with was millions of tons of contaminants. I realized very early on in my tenure uh, as CEO of the Tarpons that if the project was ever going to get done, uh, I was going to have to find a way to engage the community. When the Tarpons agency here had what was called a JAG process, I think it was called a joint action group, um, it was a citizens group here in, uh, in the Sydney area that was given a mandate to consult with people uh, about the cleanup. We objected to a citizens group uh, purporting to consult uh, with the Mi'kmaq people about the future cleanup and the use of that area. And the JAG people, although they were very well meaning, very well intentioned, um, they didn't have the same perspective that Mi'kmaq people had. We felt a pretty strong connection with the traditional use of the area and we felt that there were still rights there on behalf of the Mi'kmaq, both Aboriginal and treaty rights. We tried to tell them very politely that um, uh, it isn't your role uh, to discuss this project with us. Uh, it's the role of the federal government and maybe the provincial government to sit down and have a formal consultation process with the Mi'kmaq on this. So it took a little while, but finally, um, uh, I would say probably around 2002, 2003, Environment Canada finally understood what our position was and they began to engage us, and at the time was specifically member to, to talk about our interests and our concerns about the cleanup. And so when they began to engage us, um, the whole topic naturally began to evolve. In April and, and May of 2004, the federal and provincial governments uh, entered into negotiations to uh, essentially develop a memorandum of agreement which outlined the, uh, the nature of the project and how it was going to be funded, how it was going to be governed. Part of that commitment was to continue uh, to have the federal and provincial governments continue with negotiations, with discussions with First Nations communities uh, to enable meaningful economic participation in the project. That agreement was signed in May of 2004. Shortly after that, uh, we started uh, discussions uh, initially with Member 2 uh, on uh, participation in the project. Even before um, uh, the announcements uh, of the cleanup, we, we were uh, busy working with uh, various levels of government, both the uh, both the, uh, the federal and the provincial governments. After a lot of work, uh, the governments, uh, uh, you know, finally listened. From our side, uh, once we begin to ha began to have a forum to discuss our issues, uh, we began to expand and say, well, it's, this is not just about member two. This is, uh, this is part of the uh, Unamagi district of the Mi'kmaq Nation, and we're just one of five First Nations here on the island, and you're going to have to engage all five First Nations. So we got together with the, uh, the, five, uh, the five Cape Breton chiefs, including myself, and we talked about uh, working together uh, and, and how much better it would be, and the governments, both levels of governments, uh, seem to want that anyway, so it would be much easier for them to deal with us. In 2005, a uh, chief's resolution was signed uh, designating Member 2 as the, uh, as the representative for First Nations for any uh, opportunities with respect to the project. All of our attention then focused on economic uh, benefits that Mi'kmaq people um, since this is such a, a long-term major project on the island, that it, it was only right that Mi'kmaq people have some benefits from the cleanup. And we began to focus on saying, well, um, maybe the first step should be doing a, a pilot project. Um, and the government itself, uh, as, as uncomfortable and unfamiliar they were with us, they weren't really sure what we were capable of doing. And so they also thought that was a great idea. And so the thought began to surface that maybe um, the cooling ponds should be set aside uh, for Aboriginal contractors only. Uh, the Mi'kmaq people wanted to prove themselves, and secondly, I think the government people wanted to find out if uh, our people can actually do this work. So our energy then began to focus on getting this Aboriginal set aside. While we couldn't assign, directly assign the cooling pond project to member two or to one specific uh, entity, we did agree that we would take steps to discuss uh, 
how we could uh, set aside this piece of work for competition amongst eligible First Nations businesses. The province of Nova Scotia was, was responsible, is responsible for all procurement, uh, for all of the purchasing, for management of the project. They needed to, uh, to seek approval uh, of their cabinet. I was able to take the proposal to cabinet back in 2005 and uh, uh, have cabinet agree that this is, uh, this is a uh, pilot project worthy of us going forward with. Uh, that decision was made in September. Uh, the protocol agreement was, uh, had been negotiated and in October of 2005 uh, there was a public announcement in Member 2 with uh, ministers of the federal and provincial governments and Chief Terry Paul signing the protocol agreement on behalf of the five Cape Breton First Nations. There was a tender call for the cooling ponds and uh, a number of different contractors had submitted bids. But most of the contractors uh, had partnerships um, either with a small Aboriginal company and a large a non-Aboriginal company and uh, fortunately uh, on our behalf um, the economic assessment, I'm sorry, the environmental assessment process had changed how the cooling ponds were going to be cleaned up and so they had to cancel that tender and so when we began to pull together in January of uh, 07 we began to look at that and say we can't let this happen. I remember describing the situation as winner take all where you have a bunch of Aboriginal companies bidding competing against each other and only one company wins and then it appeared to us that one company would win that bid based on the strength of their partnership. I can envision the situation where a number of Aboriginal firms bidding, uh, one Aboriginal firm wins and then most of the work goes to somebody else. So we really uh, began to voice our concerns with government at the time and, and said so there must be a way to do this uh, in, a, uh, in a way that maximizes employment benefits or economic benefits for Mi'kmaq people. And so we began looking at a, a different way of tendering where uh, instead of having um, one winner-take-all contract awarded to uh, the best bidder, we began to look at a situation where it was a time and materials contract where several Aboriginal companies uh, would be awarded uh, contracts. They would then have the possibility of receiving different percentages of the work. Aboriginal companies were invited to bid. They, these companies had to be 51% owned and they have to show that they can reach 75% or more Aboriginal participation workforce. So three companies ended up winning the bid. There's one from Eskasoni, Norman Morris Construction, from Member 2, uh, MB2 Construction, and then there's uh, Member 2 itself, the community formed a company, and the three of them are working on this project. Norman Morris was awarded 60% of the contract, MB2 was awarded 25% of the contract, and Member 2 Haskell was awarded 15%. The project management itself was not done by any of or none of the three firms. The project management stayed with EarthTech. The cooling ponds, it's like a big pool. They use the water to cool the steel that, w that was coming out of, the, out of the steel plant and then it was, it was pumped into this cooling ponds to do exactly what it sounds like, is to cool. The sediment that came off of the, the steel went to the bottom of this cooling pond and most of it is uh, metallic. Our remediation strategy here was to take uh, slag and cement powder, blend it in with the sediments, um, and reach a compressive strength and a leachate criteria that shows us it will not leach into the environment. The cooling ponds, uh, it had quite a bit of water on it. They, I think they had estimated 16 million liters of water set on the top of this, but it turned out to be well over 20 million liters. The water had to be pumped off. It took, it took quite a bit of time to pump off the water. Water has been our big problem here. Any surface water that runs into the pond or collects on the pond has to be treated before it's discharged and, and meet criteria um, and that's a huge issue. The guys over there, they're um, removing the pipe and that pipe was connected to the cooling pond when they were draining out the water. The wall that was around the cooling ponds will have been removed and cleaned and taken to a storage area where it'll be disposed of later. Once the water was removed, 
The coolant pond's remediation itself is called an s and process, which means solidification and stabilization. We took sections called cells, and each of these cells was excavated, and Portland cement was pumped in, and it was mixed with slag and with the, the sediment that was in the coolant ponds. Each section was turned into a solid block, and those solid blocks, each one of them would be would be overcut so when they do the section next to it they would cut out a foot and redo that one again so that this block would be one solid block when it's completed and then it would be covered with clay covered with topsoil and then seeded over the top. We started in November with some pre-mobilization activities um, getting our erosion controls in place and a lot of the activity was awaiting final permitting. We really started in earnest around the 1st of December. That's not a great time of year to start a project like this. We were talking about doing earthwork and uh, cement work and um, pretty challenging and uh, the workers on, on the project met all the challenges. It started to get cold pretty quick. We had a lot of snow in December. Uh, we had snow removal efforts almost daily throughout December and then it got really cold. The pond froze hard. There was up to a foot of ice uh, on the pond. Uh, we, didn't, we missed one day throughout the winter for a weather shutdown, and that was due to wind, is that right? Yes. The cold and the snow never shut us down, nor did the rain. It was a tough winter. Um, we had a lot of snow, a lot of rain, a lot of ice, and uh, the contractors and their employees worked steadily through it. We had to fight freezing hoses, freezing temperatures, freezing conditions. There were no complaints. Guys were out there all day long. They've really done a good job. Our goal was to stabilize the pond on time and on budget and to satisfy the terms of the Aboriginal satisfied, and I believe we've done both. One of the big challenges that we had in putting together this process was the labor content. We have quite a bit of work happening, as well as Norman Morris, Joe Parsons, MB2, Haskell. We all have quite a few different projects on the go. It was a concern. In initially, but when the tender was actually awarded and the way it was awarded, it, w it worked out perfectly because we were, were able to hit that 75 percent and even higher most of the time. I was uh, handling my father's paperwork um, for the Morris trucking and part of it for the Morris Venture and we received tons of resumes. My father and I sat down and and decided who we were going to choose for the project who will be working in, in the Coin Pond project. When we first started, the first couple of weeks, we received a training. We had like about three or four training days. There's a lot of training that we had to go through and, you know, fire, fire safety, fire extinguisher, like all, all types of training. It was really helpful because there's some people that didn't know about, um, didn't know how to work in a construction site. I was always around construction, so I knew what to do and what not to do, but there were some guys walking in there that didn't know about the construction world, so we had to get training on that. The guy sitting in the 450 there, excavator, he's uh, training actually. He was coming in here as a laborer. They give us an opportunity to try things out, to get on a heavy machinery and try it out, see if we can work it and practice. I'm happy that they're given a chance to operate a piece of machinery. It was helpful and it will be helpful for the future for us as well. All of our laborers that are in there right now have certain skill sets that they've acquired on this job. And uh, it's good because it's going to help us carry over into another job as well as uh, if there's any other jobs that come up that we get, we can go after other people that are from other reserves as well that have this, these skill sets now. All of our workers are not just from Member 2 but rather we have some people from Escazoni, some people that work for us are from Nyanza. Uh, we pulled them from every reserve that we could that were people that wanted to work. A lot of them we did have in place, a lot of them were already working for me at the time. One particular person uh, we had to bring was a sample tech. She's actually now currently the sample tech that's working within the cooling pond right now. If there was a gap in this, is that we, ha we have to have people that can do the geotechnical work and do the surveying that that's required. I think that's probably the only real gap that I see here. Other than that, most of them came with the training that they needed to 
to do this job successfully. When we initial, initial, uh, did the initial uh, uh, training uh, requirements for the project, and uh, when I tried to uh, lay out where we were going to be, um, I, I was amazed at, at the skill level uh, that these guys brought to the job. Uh, these guys are, are uh, they're not afraid to move on and learn new tasks. Uh, they're, 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 multi, they're multi talented as far as I'm concerned. Uh, these guys can uh, operate equipment uh, and they're very eager to take on new tasks and learn. And um, uh, these guys, uh, when they leave this project, uh, there's, uh, they're, they're, going to, they're going to gain employment with other contractors, certainly uh, if not in, in, the, in, the, in the tarpons field, in, in other, in other uh, areas of, of construction. The Aboriginal people come in here are very quiet and they leave here with a very quiet confidence. That's what I've noticed about the crew here. Uh, uh, they've, they've, uh, they've achieved everything that we've ever uh, thought they could. And uh, I think uh, there's a great deal of pride involved here. I'm very proud of uh, the people that are working on this Coolum project from all, all three companies and all, all, the, all the members of our communities that have pitched in to make this a successful project. This was hard negotiating to get us to this point. We're the first companies out of the gate. That's important for the confidence of our, of our people to look at projects in the future, whether it's in remediation with the coal mines or remediation with whatever future sites there are. We've just presently went out and hired um, uh, another person recently, and he's going to be helping us go after other jobs that he's done this work before. So we just found it was important to bring somebody in that has already done this work to help guide the guys now that are in the crew that know how to do this work. So it's just it's just a moving forward plan that we have for the company. We're going after the jobs here right now that are native set aside, but we're actually, we're also going to go after all the jobs that are not native set aside as well. So we plan on being busy for the next eight years, and that's gonna we're gonna drag a lot of native people with us and hopefully make their lives a little better. There's not out there that we can't do. So we're going to be exploring every avenue and every job that comes available. We have the capacity within our communities to do these jobs. We have the crews, we have the people that, that can do the work. We've been saying it, but now we've done it. This has been a successful project for Cape Breton. This has been a successful project for Nova Scotia. This has been a successful project for the Tarpons Agency and for the remediation of our city. We're here to help, not to, not to be a, an obstacle, not to slow things down, but all we want to say is that, uh, you know, we're the rightful stakeholders here, and uh, we, 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 we don't shy away from progress, but we want to make sure that it gets done right and that we're included. Negotiations, no matter what type of negotiations, require a certain level of goodwill on both sides. If that goodwill is there, we can achieve a balance. The type of balance that I'm talking about is, I think, the type of balance that's already been negotiated. It's already been negotiated in our treaties. It's already been negotiated in 1725 and 1752. The type of relationship that was negotiated in our treaties, where we can live harmoniously and and still continue as nations and be able to make a modest living while doing that. I mean, it's, it's what we're trying to do. We have agreed that uh, when there, whenever there is uh, major projects on, on the island that we would get together and uh, work together on uh, getting uh, as much benefits for our people out of that particular uh, project that comes in or, or a company that comes in at, uh, on, on the island. and. We feel that uh, they would do uh, uh, a, a lot better if they come to see us uh, before any approvals. And they'll find out that uh, we're very cooperative people. In fact, that if you do talk to us, we feel that we would make things a lot easier and a lot better for you to get uh, approvals, permits, and uh, getting the, getting the, uh, the project uh, started a lot sooner they're not meeting with us. They're not a hindrance, like, you know, and that's what the fear is, like, we'll stop progress. But if you talk to us, you find out that we're, you know, very approachable, you know, and uh, we understand that, you know, work has to be done, work has to be created, you know, 
for people to benefit from it. And what we ask is to, to be part of that benefit. From our experience with uh, various companies like uh, Stora in Port Oxbury, which used to be Stora, now it's New Page, and uh, we've ha we've gotten an excellent relationship with them. We've had a, a agreement uh, for almost ten years now with uh, a very large company called Georgia Pacific, you know, and uh, that went out, went really really well. It's uh, those companies that people should see to find out, uh, you know, how well we work uh, uh, with them. There's a lot of projects that are going to need skilled labor. Um, and I see a lot of the uh, resource-based projects as opportunities for our people to gain work meaningfully uh, in, in major projects across uh, the province. And Mi'kmaq rights will become the context where Mi'kmaq prior use and ownership and interest in lands and waters has to be recognized. And as a result, Mi'kmaq people have to be involved in these projects. There will have to be economic benefit agreements. Uh, they'll have to demonstrate that uh, Mi'kmaq people were involved, were consulted, and benefited from those projects. I can guarantee you that Mi'kmaq people will do the same kind of good job, great job, on those projects if they've done it on cooling ponds. I was speaking to a colleague with the uh, Cape Breton Regional Municipality, and one of the things that um that he's trying to emphasize with people is that not only is the population across Canada aging generally, but it's even more pronounced here in Cape Breton where you have the, uh, the outflow of young people. And he told me, he said, you guys have the young people and we're going to be relying on you guys to, uh, to be firemen, to be policemen, to be this, to be that. And, and, and I think it's, um, it really struck me, that's, uh, it really struck me that He's right, we do, have, we do have the young people and there's going to be a lot of opportunities for them, especially here in this area. For us as Mi'kmaq people, I see that as the window of opportunity for us to rebuild our own communities. I tell the local people, I tell anyone else, that Mi'kmaq people have the opportunity now to rebuild and help rebuild the economy of Cape Breton.